Okay, we are on Stephen the State of Wisconsin versus Stephen Avery. We left off on page 42 with Attorney Kratz speaking, and we will pick up with Attorney Kratz speaking. On page 43, verse 5. Ready? Let's begin. The judge has told you that there's four charges. I'm very, very briefly going to talk about those four because I don't want to reiterate what the judge did. But there are four separate charges that the defendant is charged with. First degree intentional homicide. Mutilation of a corpse. Felony and possession of a firearm and false imprisonment. Now, the judge instructed you and my job today in opening statement. Again, this isn't evidence, but it is to it is a help for you. It's the cover, if you will. It's the road map. It's the overview to talk about the first legal concept that you as a jury has to understand. And that's the concept being called being and that's the concept called being a party to the crime the judge has told you that can be satisfied either if the defendant committed an offense himself or if the defendant aided and abetted another in the commission of the offense now the first two counts the homicide and the mutilation of a corpse are charged as a party to the crime. And so you will learn at the conclusion of the case, six weeks from now, if you fast forward six weeks from now, that the jury instructions will tell you that if the defendant committed any of those elements himself, or if the defendant aided in another, another, excuse me, aided and abetted another, in the commission of those offenses that you can and should find him guilty. Now I can't stand up here and predict what the defense is going to bring into this case, what cross-examination they may encounter, or if they even choose to present any kind of defense, <clears throat> nor should I. That isn't my job. My job as the prosecutor is to present our case to present the physical evidence that we have developed, to present the witnesses that have developed to prove our case. But just understand and just remember this concept when it comes time to deciding whether or not the defendant is guilty. The judge also told you about something called elements of the offense. The state has the burden of proof here. The defense has absolutely no burden, and our burden is to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge explained to you already, beyond a reasonable doubt means a doubt for which a reason can be given when considering all the evidence. Let me tell you what is, it is not, though. Beyond a reasonable doubt is not beyond all doubt. It's not 100%. And when we are dealing with a human injustice system, you can't expect beyond all doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt or comment sometimes that we have heard about that. It's beyond a reasonable doubt, a doubt for which a reason can be given. And I'm standing before you, members of the jury, telling you, that I accept that burden. I will prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. But we didn't want you going into this case expecting 100% or beyond all doubt. Because there are human factors or dynamics that go into these cases. Each case, the judge told you, has elements of those offense. We're going to go through those in just a minute. But also, 
each of the four charges should be considered separately. You shouldn't group them together and decide if he is guilty on all four or none. Each of the four counts are to be considered separately. And, in fact, there is separate evidence for all four of those counts. And finally, the defendant is presumed innocent. As Mr. Avery sits here today, because you have heard no evidence in this case, he is presumed by you, or should be presumed by you, to be innocent. However, and this is a big however, that presumption disappears at that very moment when the evidence in this case case satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty of that offense. That presumption disappears at the moment that the evidence proves that he is guilty. Count 1. The judge instructed you has two elements. And why I'm telling you this and why I'm showing them on screen or on a PowerPoint presentation is because there are serious, serious crimes. In fact, the most serious crimes that we have in the state of Wisconsin. The legal concepts aren't all that complex. We are talking about two things that we have to prove. Caused the death of somebody and did it intentionally. Nothing magic about that. Nothing complex about that, and all of you should be able to understand that. The same thing with mutilation of a corpse. Just the two elements, that he mutilated a corpse, and that he did so to conceal a crime that had been committed. You will hear evidence in this case about what the crime was, that he was trying to conceal the crime as you may have already guessed is the first degree intentional homicide mr. Avery is also charged with felon in possession of a firearm again two elements the felon in pos possession first that he possessed the firearm that seems obvious. And number two, that sometime before November of 2005, he had been convicted of a felony. Now, the judge has told you that second element is stipulated. Stipulation means that the facts are agreed to by the parties, that you can take that as already having been, been proved, beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Avery has that felony conviction. And so it's just the first element of that offense that the state has to prove. Do you all understand that? All right. Now, false imprisonment has five separate elements to the offense. Those five elements are that he confined or constrained, restrained. Note, that's in the disjunctive. He either confined or restrained Teresa Halbeck intentionally. Without her consent, he didn't have authority and he knew that he didn't have authority to confine or restrain Miss Halbeck. All right, enough of the, the civics lesson. Let's talk about what the evidence is going to show. On Monday, October 31st, 2005, beginning at approximately 2.45 p.m., the state intends to prove to you that the defendant restrained, murdered, and mutilated a 25-year-old photographer named Teresa Halbach. We're going to prove to you what happened. We're going to prove to you who committed this crime. 
We're going to prove to you where it happened. We're going to prove to you specifically it happened. And those will prove all of the elements of the offense. What we're not going to prove to you, what the judge has already told you we don't have to, and in fact can't prove to you, is why. We can't prove why the why, prove the why in a case like this. That's called motive. The reason behind the killing, what was in Mr. Avery's mind when he decided to kill this person, this lovely young woman. I'm going to introduce to you somebody. This is remarkable. This remarkable young woman was 25 years of age. She was single. She was a freelance photographer. She had her own photography business that was, although in its infancy, was doing quite well. This woman, and I will remind you several times in this opening and throughout the trial, I will remind you that we're talking about a real person. We're talking about somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, a lot of people's friends. Teresa Halbeck had her whole life in front of her, and the evidence is going to show that on Halloween of 2005, that all, that all ended. That ended in the hands of the defendant, Stephen Avery. That's it for, for today. We stopped at page 49. Part five, so we'll start there again. Uh, the next time. Hope you enjoyed the the lesson, and I'll see you. I think we're now on part ten, so I'll see you for part ten. And please subscribe, please. Thank you.